join me on our theme song, I'm on the winning side. I hope that you are tonight. us tonight. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you will bless the service tonight. Thank you for the service this morning, Sunday school. Now, Father, pray that you'll be with us, meet with us here in this place, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymnals 553 and we'll sing the battle hymn of the republic. Would you stand together please as we sing this? 553. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage of the grapes of wrath the stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on.
greet those about us tonight. me on that song, would you? We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not
seated. Usher's going to come receive the offering in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Verse 15 says, As it is written, He that hath gathered much hath nothing over, and he that hath gathered little hath no lack. The passage is talking about uh, when we supply the needs of others, God says that he'll supply our needs as well. And uh, he said no one will be without. When we give, then we supply the funds uh, for our missions and our missionaries to be able to preach the gospel and for us to be able to carry on this ministry, to be able to carry out the gospel. And that's why we have to reach our budget. And we've been uh, this summer already. I mean, our, it's been a probably one of the lowest summers I've seen financially for the church, but we need to give so that the church will be able to continue to carry out the work, so the missionaries will be able to carry out the work, and when we do that, God will supply our needs as well. That's what that passage is talking about. The flowers are missionaries to France, uh, written to us, and they were, of course, uh, we know that uh, what happened with the, the Notre Dame Cathedral there did you know that in six weeks they raised over one billion euros for that place? People are just giving one billion. And uh, the, the biggest deal is they're not even preaching the gospel there. Not even preaching the gospel. When you walk into that place, he tells about, Brother Flowers tells about it, they have a big statue of Mary there and people stop there and pray to Mary. So uh, he says, really, we need to get the gospel out. He tells about a lady by the name of goodness that got saved, and so we praise the Lord uh, for her getting saved uh, in their ministry there in France. The McLeans are missionaries to New Zealand. Uh, of course, they're still dealing with health issues, with the churches going on, and uh, they said that the people are stepping up and filling in where they're needed in the church, which is a great growing a thing uh, for that church there in New Zealand, and so they're rejoicing in that. So we need to continue to pray for those dear folks. Let's bow our heads, ask God to bless in our offering today. Dear Lord, we pray that you will bless in our offerings here at Liberty Baptist Church. Dear Lord, I pray that they would pick up and wouldn't let down, that we might be able to uh, reach our budget, dear Lord, here for the summer months. I know that we have many families gone and people who are leaving, and but Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to reach our budget. There are people depending on us. Uh, Father, that uh, we might be able to help with the missions and uh, send the missionaries out, send their funds, but not only that, but right here in Sarasota. Now, Father, I pray that you will bless our people as they give. Help us to realize our responsibility of giving our tithes and offerings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
invite you to take your hymnal 395 before our special music this evening and pastor will dismiss the little ones to the kids club tonight 395 moment by moment i'm kept in his love let's sing that together Somehow breathed into the very soul of life. The prisoner, the powerless, the slave have always known it. There's something that keeps reaching for the sky. And even life begins because a baby fights for freedom. And songs we love to sing have freedom's theme. Some have walked through fire and flood to find a place of freedom. And some face hell itself for freedom's dream. Let freedom ring wherever minds know what it means. To be in chains, let freedom ring wherever hearts know pain. Let freedom echo streets where prisons have no key we can be free and we can sing let freedom ring god built freedom into every fiber of creation and he meant for us to all be free and whole. Oh, but when my Lord bought freedom with the blood of his redemption, his cross stamped pardon on my very soul. I'll sing it out with every breath. I'll let the whole world hear it. This hallelujah anthem of the free. That iron bars and heavy chains can never hold us captive. Oh, the sun. 
has made us free, yes, free indeed. Let freedom ring down through the ages from a hill called Calvary. Let freedom ring wherever hearts no pain. Let freedom echo through the lonely streets where prisons have no key. We can be free and we can sing. Let freedom ring. We can be free and we can sing. Let freedom ring. Amen. Children, you'll be dismissed for their kids' club tonight. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Job, chapter 12. Job 12. Well, I, I'm glad you're four. Job chapter 12 and verse uh, 23. I'm glad that you're here with us tonight. If you'll stand with me, we'll read this one verse here in Job chapter 12, verse 23. Notice God's in control. God is in control. The Bible says in verse 23 of Job chapter 12, he increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. God is in control. Amen. God is in control. God made America great. God is the one that made America great. I want to speak to you about that. I'll show you from the Word of God. God made America great. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of the Word of God tonight. We know that you are in control. We know that you raise nations up and you uh, destroy nations. You're in control. You've raised America. You're the one that made America great. And we can find it in the Word of God. And Father, I pray that we would be ever grateful for that. Bless the preaching of the Word of God tonight. Speak to our hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In a college logic class, a professor was explaining how society's ideals change and change through the years. He said, take, for example, back in 1921, the Miss America, the, one, the, the lady that won the Miss America contest, she was five foot one and weighed 108 pounds. 1921. And then he asked this question. He said, how do you think that she would do in today's version of Miss America? There was absolute silence. No one said anything. And then one of the young men raised his hand and he said, I don't believe that she would even enter the contest if she were running uh, this year. And the professor said, but why would you say that? He said, for one reason, her grandchildren wouldn't let her. You have to think about that. But America's ideals have changed through the years. They have changed, and they're continuing to change. I was reading before the service tonight the things that are happening here in America. I'm just uh, astounded by the things that are happening here in America. I never dreamed that the things would happen that are happening here. never had any idea of the things that are happening. America has changed, but God is the one that made America great. Now, when you talk about who made America great, some people will go back to the forefathers, and I've done that, and we've looked at the forefathers and how they stood for our country and how they stood for godliness, and we'll talk about that even tonight. But that's not why America's great. They're not the ones that made America great. Then uh, we may look at individuals, and we may look at even presidents, and we say those individuals have made America great. No, God is the one that made America great. God is the one. 
And I want to show you that tonight. God made America great. First of all, number one, God made America great because God is sovereign over America. We're going to turn to a number of passages, and I want you to look at Psalm 47 and verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 47 and verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, The psalmist wrote, O clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Notice that. He is a great king over all the earth. God is sovereign over America. God, that word sovereign, means that God is in charge of this world. God created it, and God is in charge of it. God is in control of it. God is in control of this world. Notice what the psalmist says here. First of all, he says, clap your hands. And then he says, shout unto God. Now, he's not talking about giving God an applause. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about exalting God and glorifying God, the Bible tells us, and praising God. Why should we do this? The answer is found in that same passage. He said, because God is a terrible God, and he is king over all the earth. The word terrible there means that God is awesome. God is an awesome God. God is an awesome God, and he is king over all the earth. God is sovereign over the whole world. My friend, God is the one that made America great. God makes nations, my friend, and he breaks down nations. Amen? God is the one that does that. God is, uh, is the sovereign over all America. The Bible tells us over in Proverbs uh, 21 and verse number 1, God uses men. He uses leaders to carry out his sovereign will. Look what it says in Proverbs 21 and verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. God can move the hearts of kings. God can move the hearts of presidents. God can move the leaders' hearts. God does that because God is a sovereign God. We need to pray for our president, amen? We need to pray for our nation because God can move their heart. That's what it says right there. God can move their heart. We need to pray. For America. Abraham Lincoln believed this. Abraham Lincoln believed that God was in control of everything. He believed that God was a sovereign God. He believed that God directed the affairs of our nation. He believed that faith came from the Word of God. That's what Abraham Lincoln did. Abraham Lincoln actually carried a New Testament in his pocket all through the, the White House. Everywhere he went, he carried a New Testament. He'd pull that New Testament out and he would read that New Testament. He'd read scriptures. Not only that, but I found that he would take, and if he would see someone walk in there in the White House, he would actually pull his Testament out and read a passage to them. He'd read from the Word of God. He believed that faith came from the Word of God. He believed that God was in charge of the affairs of this nation. He truly believed that. Here's a statement that, that Abraham Lincoln said, and I'm quoting from him. He said this, I quote, that the Almighty does make use of human agencies and directly intervenes in human affairs is one of the plainest statements in the Bible, unquote. He said that is plain. God is in control, amen? God is sovereign over this word. First of all, God made America great because God is sovereign, amen? God is in control. So first of all, God is sovereign over America. Secondly, God made America great because God instituted America's government. Look over at Romans chapter 13 and verse number 1. God instituted America's government. Paul is addressing in Romans chapter 13 the church there in, in Rome. Look what the Bible says. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Paul addresses the issue of government. Paul is addressing this issue uh, to the church there in Rome. Even though Rome was a godless nation, even though the leaders of Rome, Nero was a wicked leader, Paul is saying, listen, look what he says, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. The word powers there 
literally is referring to those in authority over you. The word, uh, let every soul be subject. The Bible, the Bible says that word subject literally means to submit. We're to submit to those in authority over us. No matter, even though they were, that was a godless nation. Rome was a godless nation. Their leader, Nero, was a godless individual. And yet, Paul is saying to the church that you're to be in sub, uh, subjection to those. You're to be subject unto those higher powers. But why? Why are we to be subject unto those higher powers, unto those in authority over us? Well, he goes on to say, For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Any powers that be are ordained of God. God is the one that has allowed them to be in that place of power. That's what he's saying there. God has ordained that. God has given them that authority. The Bible tells us, For there is no power or no authority but of God, and the powers are the authority that be are ordained of God. God is the one that has allowed them to rule. And my friend, God is saying to us that we're to be in obedience to them. We're to follow in subjection unto them because God's word says that we're to do that. You say, but pastor, this is a question that people always ask. How about if they tell us to uh, or order us to violate the laws of God? Then we obey the laws of God. Amen. And Acts chapter 5. In verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. People say, well, I'm going to do what I want. You know, people say that all the time. I'm just going to do what I want. Well, then you're not obeying God's word. Not only that, if everybody did that, if everybody did just what they wanted to do, we would have absolute chaos. God has placed these people in authority over us so that there wouldn't be chaos. They're to protect us. They, the government is to protect us. And, to, and that's what the, and the Bible tells us that. And to and keep us from being uh, in chaos. God has allowed that. To, God is the one that established that authority. God is the one that instituted the government. He's the one that instituted the church. He's the one that instituted the family. God is the one that did that. We believe in the church. We believe in the family, but we also have to believe in the government because God is the one that instituted uh, the government. And he's, he's the one that told us that we need to be in subjection to those in authority over us. And if that is true, then my friend, God is the one that made America great. Amen? God is the one that did it. God is the one that did it. God is sovereign over America. God instituted America's government. And so we're to obey those laws. You might not like the laws, but my friend, we're to obey the laws. You see a sign, you're to follow that sign. If everyone neglects that sign, and there are a lot of people that neglect the signs. <laughs> they think that that, when I was in, uh, years ago, we went to the Bahamas, and uh, when I was there on a mission trip, they said, you see that stop sign? I said, yes. They said, you see that white line around there? I said, yes. They said, that means it's only a suggestion. Because they, they, they go right through the stop signs and blow the horn. They just blow the horn. They don't even stop. It's kind of like the story of the guy, that, the truck driver that was driving down the road, and he saw a sign, and it said, low bridge ahead. And, uh, and so he thought, well, I'm driving this semi, and he looked at the size, uh, and he th thought, I, well, I believe I can make it through there. And so he drove underneath that bridge, and the truck got stuck underneath that bridge. A police officer came by, and he said, got stuck, huh? The truck driver said, no. He said, I was actually hauling that bridge, and I ran out of gas. And so God made America great. God is sovereign over America. God instituted America's government. Notice this. God blessed America. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we see in verses 10 through 14, the Bible says, And all people of the earth, notice it's talking to all people, And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee 
the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the, notice this, hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. He's talking to Israel. And then he says, And thou shalt go, not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Now God is saying, listen, uh, Israel, if you will obey my commands, if you will follow what I said, you will obey them, then I am going to bless you. And God did bless them. God blessed them. Just like God blessed Israel, God will, has blessed America in the same way. God has blessed America because he said he would bless those who would bless Israel. And as long as America is a blessing to Israel, then God will bless America. That's why God has blessed America. He said to Israel, I've got one condition. You obey my commandments and I'm going to bless you. And he said, I'm going to bless everything about, about you. But then God said that he would bless those nations that would bless Israel. America has stood beside Israel. Sometimes we're the only ones that are standing beside Israel. And I believe that God continues to bless America because we are, we're standing with Israel. But I'll tell you this, the moment that we turn our back on Israel, and there are some that, there are some there in Washington that would like for us to turn our back on Israel. If we ever turn our back on Israel, brother, I'll tell you what, that's when Judgment Day is going to come. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. That's what he said. God said, I'm going to make your name great, Israel. He did the same thing for, for America. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will, here it is. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I believe God's blessed America because we've stood for Israel. <laughs> but if we ever turn then that blessing will be removed. You notice what he said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. We better be careful. But not only that, I think there's a second reason that God has blessed America, and that is because, like in Proverbs, four, Proverbs 14, 34, the Bible tells us, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I believe because of the godly heritage we have that God... Uh, has blessed America. And those pilgrims came here and they stood for our country. They came looking for God. And I'm going to talk about that more. They came looking for God. They didn't come looking for riches, but they wanted freedom. Amen. They came here and as a result of that, that godly heritage, God blessed America. God blessed America because of Israel. He promises to bless America. And then God blessed us because of our godly heritage and the righteousness that we stood for. Even when they were writing the Constitution of the United States, Benjamin Franklin, who was, uh, uh, wasn't a, truly a, a Christian, uh, but uh, he was a Gnostic. He, he was a, uh, an individual that did not stand for the, the Christianity that we stand for today, but even he quoted from the Bible to encourage people uh, encouraged them when they were writing the Constitution. He actually referred to Psalm 127, and he also referred to other passages in, in the New Testament. Here's a, a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire can rise without his aid. We have been assured in the sacred writing, that's the word of God, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, unquote. That's what Benjamin Franklin said. <laughs> he even understood that, that God is the one that will bless America. And God did bless America. God blessed America. God blessed America because we took a stand with Israel. 
and continue to take a stand with Israel. And God bless America because of our godly heritage that we have here in America. God made America great. God uh, is sovereign over America. God instituted America's government. God blessed America. Notice this. God will judge America. In Psalm 75, verses 7, 6 and 7, the Bible says, From promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one, he setteth up another. God will judge America. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. He's still sovereign. God promotes nations and God demotes nations. He will judge this nation. In fact, God uses other nations to judge nations. We can find that in the example of Israel. God used Egypt to judge Israel. God used Assyria to judge Israel. God used Babylon to judge Israel. And then after Israel was judged by those nations, you know what God did? Then God judged those other nations, didn't he? And God will do the same thing to America. God will judge America. There's a judgment day coming. If America doesn't turn back to God. Psalm 67 and verse 4. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Leviticus 18, 24. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. God says he will judge the nations. You say, well, why will God judge America well number one because of all of the abortions here in America the latest statistics from 2017 here in America in 2017 there were 879,000 abortions here in America 879,000 Abortions here in America. And you know what? There are people that see nothing wrong with abortions. We sit here tonight and we take a stand against it, but there are, there are large corporations. I was reading this article, this article right here. I just cut it out just before the service and I was reading this article right here liberal companies threaten boycott of Georgia over heartbeat law you know the new law they have about abortion there are companies that are threatening to boycott you would I, I almost hesitate to read these companies to you because you know who they are Disney threatens to stop filming in Georgia Netflix may boycott, boycott Georgia. And other nations. Well, that made you quiet, didn't it? You see, what, I, I'm just, what I'm trying to show you is the way that America's going. The pressure that's been, being put on. Is God going to judge America? I, I believe that he will. We can't do that. Not in the last four years... In the U.S., there were 3,610,000 abortions. Abortion is killing babies. 3,610,000. These are the latest statistics that have just come out. The sexual perversion here in America. Adultery, fornication... Homosexuality, same-sex marriage, transgenderism, all of these things are taking over America. I mean, I have an article right here where teacher, it says teachers face major dis duress from transgender intolerance. And it tells how the teachers in our schools are having to, they have to try to make sure that they call the student by the, if they're a he or a her, they have to, they have to, if, if they do it wrong, they get fired. 
If somebody says that they're a she and they're a he and they call them a, a, a she, then they can get fired for that job. That's what, that's, did you ever think we would be living in this day that we're living in? God will judge America. We took the Ten Commandments off of the front of all of the buildings at the courthouses. They're taking it down. And if they haven't got it down yet, they're trying to take it down. They took, what can I say? They took prayer and Bible reading out of schools. They're taking it out of the government. They don't do that anymore. The government. I can remember a day when before every football game and all the sports, they would pray. Man, when I went to school, and I went to a public school up in Michigan, we prayed every morning at the beginning of school. We prayed at lunchtime. They passed out Bibles, the King James Bible. Is that ever foreign today? Do you think that God will judge America? I think that he will. The continuous persecution of churches. I mean, Christian Law Association puts out their paper every month. Many of you get that. You read about all of the churches and Christians that are being persecuted here in America. You don't hear that on the 6 o'clock news, do you? But it's happening here in America. Continuing to happen. A man by the name of Thomas Jefferson, you heard of him. He was a deist. He wasn't even a Christian. But look what he said. This is what he said. Thomas Jefferson, I quote, Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of people that these liberties are the gift of God and that they are not to be violated but with his wrath? In other words, he says if we violate them, We'll know the wrath of God. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, unquote. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. He's saying that God's going to judge America. Back then, God will judge America. God made America great. Don't you agree with me? God is the one that made America great. God is sovereign over America. God instituted America's government. God blessed America. God will judge America. One more thing. God has a purpose for America. God has a purpose for America. And that purpose is found in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. God's purpose for America is to take the gospel into all the world. That is God's purpose. The Pilgrim Fathers, when they came to America, they came looking for God. They came with another purpose. They even stated they didn't uh, that they came uh, with another purpose they didn't come uh, the same way for the same reason that the european explorers came they came for the propagation of the gospel of jesus christ you say how can you be so sure of that because they wrote a document and it was called the mayflower compact it's historical you can see it you can read it the mayflower compact in the mayflower compact Here's a statement that they put in there. And it's written in uh, Old English. And so it may sound a little bit funny, but this is, I'm going to quote it exactly the way it was written in the Mayflower Compact. I quote, For ye glory of God and advancement of ye Christian faith, unquote. It was for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. It was for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why they came here. God has blessed this country because of those people that came here to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, that's the purpose that God has for America, the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't only the pilgrims, but in 1892, listen, the United States Supreme Court made this ruling, and I'm going to quote, I quote, our laws 
and our institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. It is impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense, and in this extent, our civilization and our institutions are emphatically Christian, unquote. The Supreme Court said that. The purpose of America was the propagation of the gospel. God made America great so that we would propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why America is great. God made America great so that we would propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. More Bibles are being printed and sent throughout the world by America than any other nation. America sends out more missionaries than any other nation in the world. America plants more churches than any other nation in the world. What is the purpose of America? The purpose is the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To continue to send the gospel into all the world. That's why God has made America great so that we would propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know what? Some people have lost their vision. They've lost their vision. Our goal is to take the gospel into all the world. Churches lose their vision. We get hung up on other things, other projects, other, uh, other things that are worthy, and I'm not saying they're not important, but you know what? Our main goal is the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to take the gospel out. All these other things, hey, they're wonderful, they're neat, but you know what? Our main goal at Liberty Baptist Church is the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing should come before that. But we get carried away doing all other kinds of things. We don't have time to tell anybody about Jesus. We don't have time for visitation. We don't have time to come to church. We don't have time to do anything for God. We are so caught up in this world and the philosophy, we have no time for Jesus and to tell others about Jesus. Listen, we need to get busy doing what we're supposed to do. Propagation of the gospel. I believe God made America great. Why? The propagation of the gospel. We don't have time for it because we're too busy doing all these other things. If you're too busy to propagate the gospel, my friend, then we're too, just too busy. We need to get the gospel out. Someone said, what, what can we do to grow the church? You know what? Go out and propagate the gospel. Go out and give the gospel out. Amen? Come out for visitation. On Thursday, on Saturday, on Wednesday. Set a time to go out and give the gospel out. Man, it's a, our, you know, our bus ministry needs to be rolling. When those wheels need to be rolling. We need to be giving the gospel out every week. Neighborhoods around here. Who else, who is giving the gospel out? No one. No one. Jehovah's Witness, they don't have the gospel. Mormons, they don't have the gospel. We have the gospel. Let's give the gospel out. That's, what, that's the purpose of America. Don't you see it? It's as plain as day. God has blessed America because that's what we're doing. We're doing a better job than anybody else. But we're doing a very poor job. We need to get out there and do that. The purpose. God made America great. Don't you, don't you believe that God made America great? God did that. <laughs> I see it in the Word of God. It's just plain to me. It's Dave. I've done hundreds of funerals. Hundreds. I don't care if I ever have to do another one. And Carlos said to me, he did that funeral. His sister-in-law up there, he said, I, he said, I, he said, I really have an understanding of you now, Pastor, after doing that funeral. He said, it was hard. I said, well, it's hard every time. It's never easy. I've done hundreds, and I've done many, many military funerals. People who fought for, fought for our country. I've, I did a funeral 
of uh, Bill Hollett up at Arlington National Cemetery. Four honors. I did the funeral up there. I preached in the chapel there at Arlington National Cemetery. Went out in the graveside. There were 21-gun salute out there and preached out there. And uh, all the military people were there and I preached the gospel. One thing I've noticed, and if you've ever been to a funeral of a, someone who fought for our country, they drape the coffin with that flag. Now, before they bury that person, when the ceremony's over, they take that flag off and they fold it up. And then they take that flag and they give it to a family member. They never bury the flag. They, they don't bury the flag, do they? They never bury the flag. And you know why they don't bury the flag? Because it's a symbol. It said the soldier may die, but the country goes on. Our nation goes on. God has allowed our nation to go on, hasn't he? For the propagation of the gospel. But I'll tell you what, if our churches quit propagating the gospel, if our churches quit giving out the gospel, I think God will say, I'm done with you. We had better take the gospel out. We'd better get our pockets filled with tracts and go out and evangelize. I was talking, like I said, I was talking with someone before the service. How can I, what can I do? Fill your pockets with tracts and go out and evangelize. All of us, that's our uh, individual responsibility to give the gospel out. How many churches are open tonight? Not very many. <laughs> They're closing the doors. They're not propagating the gospel, are they? Listen, what does that mean? That means we need to do it. We've got to get the gospel out. We've got to be doing that. I have always believed in a scheduled time to do that because I, I believe if we don't have a scheduled time, then we won't do it. But I think everywhere we go, we need to be giving the gospel out. We need to have a pocket full of tracts or a bill full, full of tracts where we're giving the gospel out. God has preserved America so that we would give the gospel out. We need to give the gospel out. God made America great. <laughs> God did that. He's sovereign over America. He instituted America's government. He blessed America. He would judge America. He has a purpose for America. Let's do what God has called us to do. Let's get busy doing that. Oh, you say it's summer and everybody's on vacation. I don't care if they're on vacation. It's like when people go on vacation. Oh, well, let's just quit. I had someone indicate to me, everybody's going to be gone. We're I said, someone said, everybody's going to be gone. I said, what, do you want me to cancel all the services? I'm not going to do that. We just keep going, amen? Keep giving the gospel out. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Will you help America fulfill the purpose for God? Will you help America fulfill its purpose for God of taking the gospel out. Will you help America fulfill its purpose for God of propagating the gospel, taking the gospel into all the world? Will you do that? Will you do it? You say, I will do it. By the grace of God, I am going to get busy propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's my hand. Slip it up all through the building. Don't raise it if you don't mean business, but raise it up if you mean business. Raise your hand up. If you don't mean it, then don't raise your hand up. Thank you very much. That's a good amount of people here. Well, let's do it. You, you won't do it in your own strength. You won't, even, you, you won't leave the house. You won't fill your pockets with tracks. You need God's help. Tonight, when we give the invitation, why don't you come and recommit yourself to that? Say, by the grace of God, I'm going to make time for witnessing every week. I think if we set a time aside every week that we'll do it. If we don't, then we won't. But then 
You need to be in the habit of every place you go, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the restaurant, when you go to visit friends, every place you go, we, we're a witness for Christ. Will you pray for America to repent and turn back to God? I think, you know, I was speaking last week about Jonathan Edwards and how the great awakening here in America and how he was used to help bring that about. I don't think it's impossible. Nothing's impossible with the Lord. We could certainly have revival. You know, sometimes it takes great tragedy for there to be revival. I, w I hate for there to be tragedy, but you know what happened? The last great tragedy we had here in America with the towers, the Twin Towers, when they went down, everyone was praying. Everyone was seeking God's face. But God can bring revival. Will you pray, begin praying every day for God to bring revival to America? Would you pray that every day? Say, I'm going to pray every day for God to bring revival to America. Would you slip your hand up? I'm going to pray every day that God would bring revival to America. Thank you very much. There aren't very many people that are praying that. We need to start praying that. You say, well, I'm just one person. Well, it starts always with one person, doesn't it? We can pray for revival, that God would bring revival to America. Then, tonight, being born in America doesn't make you saved. Some people think think because they were born here in America that they're a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian be, by being born in, here in America. Only by personally trusting Christ alone can you go to heaven. That's it. It's not by religion. It's not by baptism. It's not by your good works. It's not by being a good person. It's only by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior that you will go to heaven. There's no other way. And tonight you would say, you know what? I'm interested in being a Christian. I'm interested in going to heaven. I'd like to know more about that. Would you pray for me tonight? Would you slip your hand up and put it back down? I'd like to know more about that. I'd like to know more about being a Christian and going to heaven. I'd like to know more about that. Anyone, slip your hand up, put it back down. Can I pray for you tonight? I'm going to have a word of prayer in just a moment. And then we're going to have our old-fashioned invitation where we invite folks to come and pray here at the altar tonight. And I think it would be a good thing for us to get started tonight to pray for revival here in America, for America to come back to God, and then for us to commit ourselves and say, Lord, help me to be a witness. Some of you used to be soul winners. You used to win people to Christ. When was the last time you led someone to Christ? Why don't you come and say, Lord, help me to win someone to Christ? Help me to be a witness for Christ. Why don't you come in just a moment and pray and ask the Lord to fill you with his, whole, with his Holy Spirit and help you to be a witness for Christ. And dear Lord, we come to you tonight. And Father, we know that you're the one that made America great. You're the one that did that. You've blessed America. Father, and we pray that you'll continue to bless America. I pray that America will come back to God. It'd be a wonderful thing if they would reverse those decisions, Father, about abortion, and they would reverse those deci decisions about prayer and Bible reading in school and let kids read the Bible if they want to read the Bible and pray, not be afraid to let them do that if they want to do that and not discriminate against Christians. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd turn America around. And we know that you can do that because you... Uh, you can change the hearts of kings. The Bible says it. You can change the hearts of presidents. Dear Lord, you can change our country. You can do that. And it would be a wonderful thing. Like in the day of Jonathan Edwards and America was brought to revival. The whole nation. And certainly you can do that again. And dear Lord, I pray for our people. Help us to humble ourselves, you tell us in Chronicles, what we can do to bring our nation back to God. And I pray that we would do that. We would humble ourselves. It's going to take some Christians that would humble themselves. We can't be filled with pride and think that you're going to do anything for us. But Father, help us to be willing to humble ourselves and to kneel and to pray. Now, Father, bless the invitation tonight. Use it for your glory. 
I pray, Father, for revival in our church. Revive us. People are so filled with so many things, Father. In the summertime, many times we get backslidden away from you because we don't read our Bibles and we don't pray and we don't go to church and we don't do uh, what we ought to do. We're so caught up in uh, the things of the world that we don't have time for you. But dear Lord, I pray that you would bring revival. Do something, Father, for us. Make a change. Help our church, Father, to be on the cutting edge, to be on the edge of revival. Help us to sense revival. Father, I pray you would bless in the invitation tonight, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet. God's spoken to hearts here tonight. As we begin to sing, why don't you come? Let's pray for America.